Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. Joining me today is Sebastian Edwards, the Henry Ford II Chair in International Management at the UCLA Anderson School of Management. From 1993 until April 1996, he was the Chief Economist for Latin America and the Caribbean region of the World Bank. He is the author of many books. The latest is American Default, the untold story of FDR, the Supreme Court, and the battle over gold. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Sebastian. Uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, a real pleasure. Your book is the story of a time that is oddly forgotten uh, when, between 1933 and 1935, in your words, FDR, Congress, and the Supreme Court agreed to wipe out more than 40% of all public and private debts. But your interest in this somewhat forgotten period begin with some of your experiences working with economies of Latin America. How did, how did that happen? Uh, yeah, that that is correct. Um, so uh, my background as an economist is um, as a development uh, macroeconomist. And throughout my career, I spent a lot of time uh, researching issues uh, related to uh, sovereign defaults in the developing world, and mostly in Latin America. And in 2002, I got a phone call from one of the main um, law firms in New York, and I was asked by a law partner if I could um, help them uh, write an uh, expert report on the Argentine uh, default of 2002, which was a major default. They ended up paying uh, 23 cents uh, on the dollar. And as I was uh, reviewing the brief written by Argentina, um, I found one paragraph that said something along the following lines. By the way, there is an international precedent to what we have done, and that has to do with FDR and the U.S. in 1933. And what the U.S. did is that it changed retroactively all debt contracts. And then the Supreme Court said, that that was okay. And I said, oh God, how come I don't know about this? And I started asking around and almost no one knew about this episode. Uh, there were, of course, some economic historians that knew, but almost no one knew about it. And I said, well, someone has to research uh, this case, uh, tell this story, and um, analyze uh, how similar it was to the Argentine uh, default of 2002. And, um, after all those years, here is the book. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of research that went into it. And, and you start by talking about the Great Depression, because, of course, I think it is important to contextualize how bad it was in 1932, 1933, uh, when FDR took office. Have, have any of us, at least in America, seen anything like the Great Depression and what was happening at that time? Um, certainly we have not. Um some people uh, during uh, what has uh, been called now the Great Recession, the big crisis that started in uh, 2008 with the subprime debt, uh, they have said that it, it was in some sense similar. Uh, but if you look at the data, uh, it was very, very, very different. Uh, during the Great Depression, uh, there were uh, industries uh, where output went down by 80%. Uh, the automobile industry, which uh, uh, was taking off and, and was very important in the Midwest, um, agricultural uh, sector was wiped out, and prices collapsed. Uh, the price of uh, commodities went down by around 80%. Um, and uh, deflation uh, can be very destructive. Uh, so we haven't seen anything anything like that. And, and, and what really happened during the Great Depression it, 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 is that it was worldwide. Uh, as I say in the book, there was nowhere to go. Uh, you could not uh, emigrate and go to Argentina or Australia or anywhere. It was every country in the world uh, was affected by uh, the same problem. Now, during the campaign with Hoover, with FDR in 1932, uh, did FDR campaign on this issue of gold? I mean, because we, we, in American history class, you learn about like William Jennings Bryan and the cross, uh, the cross of gold speech and something that was a big campaign point. Was this something that FDR talked a lot about? Did he make some sort of cross of gold speech himself when he was campaigning? Um, no, he he did uh, he did not do that, and I, I make a point uh, in the book uh, of uh, arguing and showing uh, 
uh, by going into the archives, uh, not only of the Ars archives, but also of uh, the archives of uh, uh, and the papers of his main advisors, um, they uh, did not uh, know what to do or did not consider the gold issue as uh, something important. Um, uh, and in fact, um, as the campaign took off um, in August, and uh, President Hoover realized that he um, was running behind, he accused FDR of wanting uh, to uh, take the U.S. off gold. And uh, FDR's response was, no, um, I uh, commit myself to sound monetary uh, policy. He did say something vaguely about silver. Uh, he said, I will do something about silver. Uh, he didn't say what something was, uh, nor did he give in any details. So the point I make in the book is that this was not a preconceived idea of taking the U.S. Uh, off gold. The notion was floating because the British had done that in September of 31. Uh, but, but, but pretty much the idea was that um, uh, FDR and the, Demo the Democratic Party were going to pursue sound monetary policy and by and large maintain the gold standard. And then he takes over and things sort of evolve in a way where he's sort of forced to get off the standard. For, forced by, by the... By, just... by, by, by circumstances. So, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm neither a lawyer nor was I born in this country. So for me to study this uh, period, and uh, uh, which I didn't study in high school, uh, I didn't take American history because I grew up in, in South America, uh, but to, to study this uh, uh, period and then go into the archives was fascinating. Uh, the first thing that happened is that, uh, for instance, on, uh, in mid-February, um, there was an attempt on FDR's life. They, uh, uh, when he came back from vacation and he uh, was uh, uh, traveling through the streets of Miami in an open uh, car, um, someone fired at him and killed um, the person who was sitting by him, the mayor of uh, Chicago. Uh, and the day after that, on February 14th, uh, there was a big banking crisis. And the day uh, FDR took over, uh, at that time, uh, it was uh, the first Saturday in March when he was inaugurated. His first act was to close every bank in the U.S. Uh, because um, um, there was uh, such a, very, a deep crisis. So one event led to another, the crisis, closing the bank, um, uh, the run on the banks, the fact that people were taking gold out of the banks and taking it uh, home, um, um, led to a situation uh, where at the end he was forced uh, to take the U.S. Um, off uh, the gold standard. Uh, there, there's another um, wrinkle to this, which has to do with the populist uh, bloc uh, in, in Congress and in the Senate. And there, there are a couple of senators uh, who play a very important role in this whole uh, drama. See, I find it interesting the force because, I mean, the gold standard is a big contentious thing and here at Cato and monetary economists and a lot of libertarians think it's a, a great thing. And as you mentioned, uh, England had gone off of it in 1931 uh, and we had these runs on the banks and things. But even if you're forced to go off the gold standard, which I'm not a monetary economist, so I'll, I'll grant that, does, does that require confiscating people's gold? No, it does not. In fact, um, uh, the British uh, went off the gold standard and did not confiscate uh, people's uh, gold, uh, which uh, we did um, uh, in April. Uh, so the sequence of events is very interesting. So um, uh, uh, FDR is inaugurated on March 3rd, uh, 4th, excuse me. Uh, the night of the 5th, uh, he declares a, a national bank holiday. Um, and the big debate there is under what uh, legal authority he can do that. And he decides uh, to do it under the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917. That's the kind of law. That's the kind of law that always seems like a really dangerous law, the Trading with the Enemy Act. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and, and especially when we were not at war with anyone and there was no enemy that we had declared. So. The Trading with the Enemy Act uh, of 1917 was passed uh, in order to make sure uh, that the federal government could uh, put in place a gold embargo so that the enemy would not get the gold. 
Who's the enemy uh, so here? The enemy in 1917 was oh, okay. the Germans. Now, who's the enemy but, in the New Deal? Right, but in the New Deal, there, there, there is no enemy. So um, uh, he uses that authority, um, which is very doubtful, and there was a big uh, legal controversy. And finally, his uh, newly appointed uh, attorney general, uh, Homer Cummings, um, writes an opinion saying that it's okay to um, to 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 base uh, the holiday on that act. So anyway, so uh, he's inaugurated. There is uh, this banking holiday uh, which lasts for one week. At the end of that week, uh, FDR gives his first fireside uh, chat and tells people we're going to reopen most banks and the ones that we reopen are going to be sound. So bring back your money and your gold. And people do bring back their money but don't bring back all the gold. So there's still gold in uh, people's hands. And then um, on April 5th, he decides to confiscate the gold and to force people through an executive order to surrender all their gold to the Federal Reserve. And they will be paid the ongoing price, which is $20.67 per ounce. Which had been set like 30 years previously, correct? No, 100, 100 years previously, in 1834. Uh, uh, so it's a hundred years, and 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 people surrender that. And I have in the book the, a, a photograph of the posters that they placed in the post offices and in the uh, in different places. And people surrender their gold. And a few months later, then when the people had already sur surrendered their gold, uh, the price of gold went up to thirty five dollars uh, an ounce. Well, that was just set by FDR, though. That was said by FDR on January 31st, 1934. And that is uh, that act is what uh, triggers uh, the cases that go to the Supreme Court. Uh, there are people that say, um, we have contracts uh, that say that we have to be paid in gold coin equivalent. And since an ounce of gold now is $35, we have to be paid in paper dollars 69% more than uh, the original contract, because the contract is in gold coin equivalent. I want to step. And those are the cases that go to the Supreme Court, and uh, and at the time we're very famous. But w what I say in the book is that we seem to have entered a period of collective amnesia, where we don't want to remember the fact that there was a time, not too long ago, my dad was alive. He had been born a few years earlier. Um, when the U.S. acted like a banana republic, <laughs> we, we annulled uh, contracts, debt contracts, uh, retroactively, unilaterally imposing severe losses on investors. And when Argentina or Greece or any of those countries do this, we point fingers at them and we tell them contracts are sacred. You don't do this. This is a banana republic type of thing. And <laughs> we didn't know that long ago. I want to step back a little bit to the to the theories about this because so taking a, taking America off of gold, the, the question here, the words that get thrown around when you read histories of the time, and I'm, I'm kind of a student of the New Deal, so your book was particularly interesting to me, but you get these sort of inflationist and deflationist kind of people, and a, a lot of political rhetoric around this, uh, you know, senators saying I'm an inflationist or I'm a deflationist, and, and FDR's position seemed to be that he had to raise prices, that this was the the absolute goal of so much that he did. The Agricultural Adjustment Act was trying to raise commodity prices to 1926 levels, and the National Recovery Administration, National Industrial Recovery Act was also trying to fix prices in different industries. Um, and was the was the gold part, part of that idea of raising prices? Uh, yes, um, uh, that was, uh, it, it was part of the idea. So, um, all the points you make are great points, and and, I, and you're right. So uh, FDR uh, campaigned on the basis of, uh, of course, ending the depression, but uh, part of that was raising agricultural prices. And um, at that time, um, people were beginning to understand uh, that deflation was uh, really bad for the economy. And it was bad for two reasons. The first one, is that if prices are going down and you expect that they will continue to go down, you postpone uh, purchases, in particular big item 
uh, 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 purchases. So if prices of cars are going down and they're going to be 50% lower uh, by year end, then you wait until the end of the year to buy your car. And if you continue to postpone, the demand collapses and that's bad. And the second point is that if prices go down, people that have debts relative to what they produce, um, their debt goes up. And I um, show in the book that, uh, for instance, in terms of uh, uh, bushels of corn, uh, the debt uh, that farmers had sort of tripled. So when they took the debt, uh, the mortgage in 1926, it was so many bushels of corn. And by 1932, it was three times more bushels of corn. Uh, so FDR wanted to capture, bring this to an end. And there were theories there that said that if you uh, increase the price, the dollar price of gold, the dollar price of every commodity will follow almost immediately and will increase by the same amount. Even if you're not on the gold standard? Uh, even if you are not in uh, in the gold standard, that was that was the theory the theory at the time. Now, uh, one should take into account that, uh, as I said earlier, uh, we didn't have a lot of information or historical evidence on which to base um, uh, our analysis. Uh, the price of gold had been twenty dollars and sixty seven cents per ounce since um, uh, eighteen thirty four. And before that, it had been $19.60 since Alexander Hamilton founded the Mint. So <laughs> we had had two, only two prices of gold since independence, 19.6, and then a very small adjustment to bring the price of gold in line with the price of silver in the rest of the world in 1834. So it was not crisis-related. Then we had a brief interruption of the gold standard uh, or, or aspects of it during the uh, uh, the Civil War, and then again during uh, the, uh, the, the during First uh, uh, World War. So, pretty much, we had three observations to go by. Uh, so, economists had no idea what was going to happen, um, but at the same time, there was no evidence for them to actually study. The history. When we talk about this, uh, these prices going down, and and, and is it that being FDR and a lot of his brain trust obsession, it, that seems a little counter counterintuitive because generally, when things become cheaper, this is not a bad thing. If a Model T becomes cheaper, if corn becomes cheaper, uh, people will adjust. We'll have fewer people producing corn, but they can produce more corn, and we can adjust around this. Doesn't it kind of go against the free market? Ideology. I mean, you're a Chicago grad, so but it, you know <laughs> that that playing with these prices is a little bit it crazy. Does. Yeah, no, it does. It does. And when uh, when my mother asked me uh, what was my new book about, and I told her, she was uh, sort of surprised and said, "I love it when prices go down." So the problem is that if it is generalized um, and it's very uh, acute, then you have uh, the two. Uh, problems that I just mentioned. What, what we think, what we like is that relative prices change and some prices go up reflecting greater scarcity or or greater quality in some goods and some prices go down. So relative prices moving around. That we like as, as economists. We think that that is a reflection of the market and it provides the right incentives uh, for people to allocate their resources and their effort to the right sector. Uh, but when uh, prices go in general down, um, you, you have the two problems that I mentioned. People postpone consumption because they're waiting for lower prices. And uh, uh, what is more serious is that the real value of debt goes up very significantly. And uh, econo I mean, monetary economists, uh, 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 in particular Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz in their famous uh, monetary history of the United States, recognize this and and, and and very in great detail analyze all of this now when they when they confiscate or they they didn't confiscate the gold they did pay people the twenty dollars and sixty seven correct they did pay people twenty and sixty seven um and then um, uh, if one I, I think that if one looks at this from today's perspective the most impressive thing has to do with gold certificates 
So uh, this is a, a, a story. These were called yellow bags. And, uh, so if you had gold, you had bars or coins, you could take them to the treasury and give them to the treasury for safekeeping because you didn't want to have those coins in your house. And the treasury would give you a certificate. Um, and then uh, when you when they when they pass this executive order, you could not get your 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 gold back. They would give you money. And say you just kept your certificate, and so this means uh, the treasury is still holding your gold. Then uh, when the price went up to thirty five, and your certificate said one ounce of gold, instead of giving you back the new. Uh, the price, $35 an ounce, they still gave you 20 and 67. Um, and, and, and this is what people found particularly uh, surprising and irritating. You had given physical gold for safekeeping, and then they didn't want to give it back to you, which was okay. So give me the money equivalent, but they didn't give you the new price. They gave you the old price, lower, much lower. Yeah, it's kind of mind-blowing. A lot of people may not know that it was legal to own gold illegal to own gold privately in America from basically 1933 until 1975. But how how about, I don't know, jewelers or artists or dentists or people who make electronics with gold? How, I mean, how, were they all like drug yeah, dealers were, buying were on the black market? Uh, <laughs> yeah, three exceptions to the, to the executive order. Uh, industrial use, which meant uh, jewelry, uh, jewelry uh, making, and uh, 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 and dentists, I, I suppose. I mean, I know the dentists, but I don't know if they <laughs> fall under industrial use. And coins of numismatic value, so uh, coin collectors could keep uh, their collection. Uh, big problem was that the secretary of the treasury. Uh, Will Wooden um, had one of the most important coin collections in the world. Uh, so uh, it was exempted, um, but the greatest or one of the greatest beneficiaries of that exemption was the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, who was a very nice guy, very loyal. He was a Republican, but served under, under FDR anyway. Uh, but uh, So there were those exemptions. And then newly minted gold was a question. Uh, what did you do with newly minted uh, or newly mined gold? How, what price did you pay for it? And until August of 33, they were paid the, the, the old price. And then in August of 33, FDR tried for a few months an experiment, which is uh, known as the gold purchasing program, uh, which uh, uh, did not work out. And it, it was the brainchild of uh, a pretty obscure um, economist uh, who taught at Cornell at the time. George F. Warren. <laughs> George yeah. F. Warren. Who yeah. seems like so the most important I, economist. I, I, haven't, I haven't done the exhaustive research on this, or I've tried, but I, I, I'm going to hedge my bets here. Um, I think that there are three economists who were or have been on the cover of Time magazine without ever holding public office. One is Milton Friedman. The other one is John Maynard Keynes. So we know those two guys. Yep. Those are giants. <laughs> and the third one is George Warren. <laughs> and I can go around a, 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 the a Department of Economics uh, to the Department of Economics in the U.S., and 99% of the faculty would not know who George Warren was. And he was the most powerful economist in the U.S., during the second half of 1933. I'd like to read this this <laughs> this quote here on on uh, page 103 of your book. Um, yeah, during the second half of 1933, George F. Warren was the most influential economist in the world. Almost every morning during November and December, he met with FDR while the president was still in bed and helped him decide the price at which the government would buy gold during the next 24 hours. Henry Morgenthau Jr., who often attended these meetings, confi confined to his di diary that the process had a cabalistic dimension to it. In selecting the daily price, FDR would, FDR would jokingly consider the meaning of numbers or flip coins. On one occasion, he decided that the price would go up by by 21 cents with respect to the previous day. He then asked the group assembled around his bed if they knew why he had chosen that figure. When they said that they didn't, the president smiled broadly and remarked that it was a lucky number. It's three times seven. That seems insane. Is that, is that, is that a good, is it, that a good, it was insane. okay. It was totally insane. So much so that it prompted uh, John Maynard Keynes uh, to write an open letter to the president 
uh, which was published uh, in the New York Times on uh, December 31, uh, 1933, where he told the president that the gold buying program made the dollar uh, look like a drunk. Uh, it's, uh, the dollar looks like it's on the booze, uh, he said, <laughs> and it is not the kind of uh, dignified policy that a country like the U.S. should follow. And shortly after that, then um, FDR uh, ended uh, the gold buying program. And uh, George Warren uh, Starr was eclipsed, and uh, he sort of disappeared from the scene. And uh, a couple of years later, he died. Now, this had some severe international ramifications because we were kind of beginning to build this international monetary system to some degree, at least the, the, the birthing pains of it. And there was a London monetary London Monetary and Economic Conference uh, that featured, I mean, especially France and Britain and America kind of fighting over how these currencies would be denoted. What was that conference like? And there was some, there was some drama there. I, I, there was a lot of drama there. Um, and uh, uh, so, so um, FDR and his advisors um, wanted to solve the U.S. domestic problems first. They didn't want to deal with international issues. Uh, but they inherited a lot of international problems from uh, Hoover or international unsolved uh, issues, uh, including the fact that the debt moratorium uh, that had been uh, declared uh, in uh, 31 uh, by Hoover uh, had come to an end. And then France and the U.K. Um, had to start paying their debts uh, to the U.S. again. So there were a number of, and, and, and there was the Smoot-Hawley uh, Act, and uh, the Brits had put in place uh, the Imperial Preferences Act, so protectionism uh, was uh, coming, uh, uh, inching, uh, or uh, moving up very quickly. So the conference, in principle, had, which was um, agreed uh, upon during the Hoover administration, uh, would deal with uh, debt, uh, with currencies, and protectionism. Um, and, and the end of the of the of the depression, um, and uh, reluctantly, uh, FDR sent uh, a team, uh, which was um, uh, headed by the Secretary of State Cordell Hull. And one of the issues was how to stabilize uh, currency values. And when they were about to come to an agreement, FDR sent a very famous cable, uh, which is known as uh, FDR's bombshell accusing uh, France and the UK of uh, trying to sabotage the US. And, and, uh, and, and, and he said, I don't, I'm not interested in stabilizing the exchange rate. And, and this was very um, uh, humiliating for Cordell Hall, who almost resigned over it. Uh, but uh, but, but, but uh, FDR was a charmer, so he invited him over to spend some time with him uh, in uh, Hyde Park. And, 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 and Hall stayed. Uh, and, 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 and became the very well-known, very highly respected Secretary of the Treasury of the State in, 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 uh, in American history. Now, the, we're going to get back to the gold clause cases here because I, I am a, a lawyer and, uh, as I said, I had a new interest in the New Deal and I read the gold clause cases in law school. I think most people do, or at least an excerpt from it. And a lot of times in law school, you read these cases and you're reading so many pages that you... you don't pay attention to the backdrop. And I remember reading this case and, and it said, you know, FDR made private ownership of gold illegal. And I was like, what? Uh, and, and then the case stands for these contract clause and other issues. But I'm going to talk a little bit how the case like went up to the Supreme Court. Um, they had taken these gold clause contracts, which explain again exactly what that was. And, and was it in basically every contract? And also it, it was in private contracts, but it was in public contracts too. So, so uh, the gold clauses said, as I pointed out earlier, uh, said that the debt was written um, in uh, gold equivalent, gold coin of the current degree um, level of purity. Um, so that meant that uh, you uh, got uh, uh, a loan and you committed yourself to uh, paying back uh, the gold equivalent of what you took in. And those clauses were put into contracts during uh, the Civil War. 
when there were two currencies circulating uh, side by side, the greenbacks, which did not have gold backing, and the uh, backed uh, dollar. Uh, so they were put in the Supreme... In, 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 the, in 1863, they became uh, uh, a, common, uh, a common part of, of, of loans, and people maintained them. So by 1933, um, almost every single bond and mortgage in the U.S., so these are private loans, had a gold clause. Since the price of gold had been constant and the scare through during the Civil War had been dissipated, so at the end we went back and everything was convertible and gold was available, people didn't pay much attention to, to that. So let me give you an example. The Dow uh, bond index had 30 bonds at the time. 29 of them had a gold clause. Okay. So almost every private debt was written with a gold clause. And after 1917, government uh, public debt was required by law to have the gold clause. You could not, the government could not issue debt without the gold clause, government debt. Now, in terms of debt equivalent, the total debt that had the gold clause was calculated to be $120 billion dollars. And GDP was estimated, we didn't have very good statistics then, but it was estimated to be at most $80 billion. So more than about 140% of the GDP was written um, with a gold clause. Uh, to make things, uh, uh, put things in perspective, today the public debt of the U.S., government, the federal debt, is less, or almost about 100% of GDP. So everything was under the gold clause. And when FDR thought or, or, or was prompted by the inflationist uh, senators, uh, Elmer uh, uh, Thomas and uh, Burton Wheeler in particular, he is prompted to devalue the dollar. Um, he said, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to get off the gold standard and do what the Brits did. His advisors told him, hold on. If you do that the value of every debt is going to go up by the amount of uh, adjustment of the price of gold. Yeah, so I want to just be clear, as I said, as a non-economist lawyer, that, so, yeah. so, you, so let's say I buy a, a house in 1914, yeah. and I get, I don't know, maybe a $3,000 loan, that's probably about yeah. maybe what a house was. And so the gold clause in there says that, that I can pay, is it, is it I can pay it back in the equivalent gold value of the time? Because is this really a thing to protect the creditor um, against inflationary monetary policy? So they can ask for the gold if the money if the money becomes relatively worthless? That That is exactly what it's trying to do, right? Okay. And, and, and uh, as I said, it's put on during the Civil War because uh, you could try to pay your debt back with uh, greenbacks, which were unbacked by gold, but a greenback was not worth the same as a dollar uh, that was backed by gold. So to protect creditors, um, every uh, every loan had, or almost every loan had the gold clause in it. But because the price was so stable, but, it didn't really you're, matter. You're, you're right. That's, that's the point I was going to make. But since the price had not changed, it didn't matter. Yeah, so so the real problem here seems to be FDR's decision to raise the price from twenty dollars and sixty seven cents an ounce to thirty five. So then the problem was that the that the creditors could call on their debt and ask for it now in the new price of gold, and that means that it sort of is, it every, seems like every, a windfall. Every, every railway, every utility, every electrical power company, um, uh, every mortgage debtor would have gone bankrupt. Or most of them, because they would have have had to pay sixty nine percent more. So I can see how they could say it was necessary to to so Congress passes this act that says all these clauses and contracts that go back decades are now no longer valid. Uh, I can see that would be necessary if you raise the price of gold, but you don't have to raise the price of gold. He could have confiscated gold and kept gold at twenty dollars and sixty seven cents. Yeah, but we can get to that later. Okay. There, there, there is a wrinkle to that. You, you could have done that, and, and I discussed that in the book to some extent. Uh, so, But going back to the gold clause, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, and then, uh, so FDR says, uh, well, uh, we have a huge majority in both houses of Congress 
let's Congress pass legislation annulling uh, these clauses. And that's what Congress does on June 5th of 1933. And it's a joint resolution. I'm not a lawyer, but uh, joint resolutions are not that common um, of the House and the Senate. And the uh, gold clauses are abrogated. Uh, so now the, gar the Congress says, uh, yes, all these debts were written uh, in gold equivalent, but they can be discharged from now on, independently of when they were written. They can be discharged in paper dollars um, at the old uh, value of the dollar. So, so thou, as a as a lawyer, that's the where you come in with this. There, there's a few clauses in the Constitution, but one of them, for example, says that the federal government shall not impair obligations to contracts, uh, and that seems like a really good example of impairing obligations to contracts. So a few cases get filed uh, that get put together into what we call the gold clause cases. Uh, what, what are those different, what are some of those cases that get filed? Yeah, there are, there are so, so as people get paid uh, in, with paper dollars at the old lower price, they bring the cases to court and there's like a huge confusion. Um, and so the government asks uh, the Supreme Court to consolidate the cases, and the four cases go in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, two of them are private debt, and two of them are public uh, debt. The private debt cases, um, one is a railway bond, um, where the uh, holder has a bond, I don't know, $10,000 bond, and he wants back 16900 which would be maintaining the gold equivalent at the new price of gold. The government is not part of that case. It's private. It's a private debtor and a private creditor. The second private case is a mortgage where the senior, uh, it's a bankruptcy case, excuse me, it's a bankruptcy case where senior creditors have gold clause debt and they want to be paid in gold equivalent. The junior uh, unsecured uh, non-gold clause uh, creditors say no, because if you pay them at the new price, the amount of money left over for us is going to be diminished significantly by 69%. And the um, uh, uh, Reconstruction Financial Corporation, which is a government agency, is one of the junior uh, creditors. So the government, because of that, can be part of that. I'm not a lawyer, but because of that, it's part of that private case. So the government is part of that private case because um, it is uh, a, a, a creditor in that bankruptcy. The two public sector cases come through the Court of Claims. The Court of Claims asks the Supreme Court what to do. Uh, they don't know wh whether they should uh, uh, accept these uh, cases. And one is a liberty bond. Um, which is issued in 1917, um, and the holder of that bond wants to be paid at the new rate. And the other one is a gold certificate, which, as I explained, uh, many people consider to be a warehouse uh, voucher or warehouse uh, coupon. Um, and they say, <laughs> I gave you guys an, a bar of gold. I want my bar back, but I understand that it's illegal for me to hold it, so give me the money equivalent at the new price of gold. And the government says, no, we'll give you the money equivalent, but at the old price. So those four cases go in front of the Supreme Court. And, and they are heard on January 8th through 11th of 1935. And it didn't seem, during the oral argument, uh, there was some some laughter and some mocking and some questions from the Supreme Court. It, it didn't seem to go too well for the government. Right. So, so it, it, what is interesting is that... Um, uh, so the timeline, and I have in the book the timeline, which is interesting. The the the, the confiscation um, uh, of gold um, is in on April 33. The joint resolution annulling the clauses is in June. The dollar value of gold is increased by 69 percent in January of 34, and the cases are heard in January of 35. So there's a whole year where the, uh, the the country is functioning at the new price of gold. 
and things are going well. The country is recovering. So when the when when the cases are heard, people that are not claimants really don't want the gold clause uh, to be uh, the the the, uh, the annulment. Uh, to be uh, ruled unconstitutional because they think, well, the, the country is recovering and the government does not do very well in uh, in arguing these cases. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's argued first by the uh, attorney general himself. Um, uh, I did a little research on how common it is for attorney generals to argue in front of the Supreme Court. Very rare. I found out that it's rare. Yeah. It, it was not the only time nor the first time, nor the last time, but very rare. Uh, and the protocol, at least at the time, seemed to be that when the attorney general argued the case, the justices, because of deference, did not ask questions or interrupt. So the first day goes smoothly. Uh, Homer Cummings gives a speech, uh, uh, and, 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 and nothing happens. And the second day, uh, the solicitor general and some deputy solicitor generals start arguing, and they get interrupted um, and, and mocked, and there is laughter, uh, and, and all sorts of problems. And um, you read the, the, the press of the time, and there is generalized concern that the government, or, 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 or agreement that the government has done very poorly, and people think uh, the court is going to uh, annul uh, the joint resolution. It, the, the court had just, had just uh, a, a few days earlier, uh, had ruled on uh, uh, the Panama oil case, also known as the hot oil case, and it had ruled against the government. So there was a lot of concern uh, by this point that uh, the court uh, maybe was becoming uh, very skeptical uh, about the new deal, which it did later. So, so here we are in <laughs> mid-January of 1935, and people think, oh, my God, this is going to be bad for the government, and people start preparing for this. And, and that's another thing that I found out, which is that FDR uh, decides that he's, if, if the court rules against the government, he's not going to abide by the court's ruling. Yeah, he writes a speech that you. I find it great that you found there's in the archives. Is it's a, it says it's written in his hand. This is the speech I would have given if the Supreme Court would have struck down the annulment yeah, the of night, the gold the clauses. Night after the day. Yeah, and, it, and it's it's it. It's basically precipitating a constitutional crisis, which oh, yeah. which he um which he would a couple of years later anyway. Uh, so mm -hmm. it would just been earlier than the court packing plan. And exactly. there were there's a lot of natching, there was a lot of hand wringing and everything from the government coming up. And FDR continually made this argument, which you point out multiple times, that was just wrong. Where he kept he would always say that there there's not enough gold in the world to cover all the debts from the gold clauses. Uh, and that was that just seemed to be the, either he didn't understand or he was just demagoguing. I'm not sure why why is that a bad argument. Yeah, no, I think that he didn't understand that. And uh, um, there is a beautiful article uh, written in uh, 32 uh, by um, Jacob Biner, who at the time was a professor at the University of Chicago and ended up his career at Princeton, very distinguished international economist, uh, and who actually was one of the first uh, professional economists who advised the Roosevelt Treasury, starting in 34. And Viner says, um, uh, we have a pyramid of uh, credit and in, 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 uh, in this country, and gold is the base of that pyramid. It, it's not the whole pyramid. Um, uh, so you don't need to have uh, all of credits uh, backed by gold. All you need is to have a solid base uh, in this pyramid. And um, FDR did... Um, uh, uh, he was very smart, so I don't think that he didn't understand that. He was just uh, using that argument because it resonated with uh, with people. Which he was good at. Uh, he was he was very good at yeah. that. And, and, and one of the things that I did while doing this research was to uh, listen to many of his uh, of his uh, speeches, um, and he was very reassuring, a uh, uh, slightly nasal uh, voice, a uh, tenor timbre. Um, a patrician uh, accent. Uh, um, he was he was uh, a master. Yeah. So the case, the decision comes down, and the and Charles he Evans, Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes, uh, it, it's a little bit split. 
because uh, there's four cases here and there's two private, two public, but but overall it's a victory for the government. But it's it's kind of an interesting victory in a way. It is in very way. interesting. So the, the private cases. So so let me slice it the following way. There is no disagreement that Congress can change contracts going forward. Okay, so the Congress can say from now on we uh, uh, don't allow gold-based contracts. Uh, that's that's not an issue. That's of course Congress can do it. On the private cases, um, the the government position is that the Constitution uh, very clearly gives Congress in uh, Article One, Section Eight, uh, power to coin money and determine the value thereof, uh, or mint money. I think it says. It says coin coin money and regulate the value thereof. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's uh, yeah, it's one of the powers of Congress and. And what, what the court decides by five to four, and it's not that controversial, is that um, uh, if in order to uh, run monetary policy, as, as it were, uh, Congress decides that uh, you cannot have or should not have uh, gold written private contracts, it can do that. So that was the argument for the private, for the private cases. Congress has the power uh, to determine the value thereof and can can define what is legal money. And if they say paper dollars are legal money, they are legal money. And if they are legal money, you can pay private debts using that legal money. The problem came with the public debt cases. And um, there, um, the chief justice who wrote the opinion uh, did something quite remarkable, which is he said, yes, um, Congress does have the power to regulate the value of money. But it also has the power to issue debt on the credit of the United States. And issuing uh, debt means that you are, at the same time, uh, committing yourself to paying it back. Thus, he said, you cannot use one power to contradict or eliminate another power. So it is unconstitutional for the government to annul the gold clause in public debt. And then he added, however, there are no damages because the price of things, prices, because of what we said earlier of deflation, prices have gone down and the purchasing power that the holder of the debt would obtain by getting his or her money under the old price is enough to buy the same amount of goods, the same basket that he or she could have bought at the time he or she bought the bond. So it's unconstitutional, but there are no damages. Thus, the government wins. Yeah, you 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 compare it. It's a incredibly, uh, I don't know, weaselly opinion. That's not the word. It, it, it's 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 very very deft, and it and it gets around some of the issues, but you compare it to Marbury in the sense of, of being able to rule that something is unconstitutional and at the same time say, well, nothing happens because of that, right? right? right. And get out right. from right. under so, it. So at the time, I mean, there are lots, I mean, and what is surprising is that if you go, if you go back to the uh, uh, law review articles uh, uh, of the time, they are replete with articles uh, about this, uh, these uh, uh, cases. And uh, at the same time, 80 years later, uh, we have collective addition. But one of the points that the scholars, scholars make at the time is that it is like Marbury. But this also generates a, uh, a rift between the Chief Justice, uh, Charles Evans uh, Hughes, and uh, Justice uh, Stone, who would become Chief Justice a few years later. Because Stone thinks that um, it's enough to say that for the court to say that there are no damages and there's no need to rule on the constitutionality of the issue. And uh, so he writes a long letter to his son, which you can find in his archives, uh, making that point. But, and, and, and some scholars uh, agreed with him. So from I'm not a lawyer, uh, but after doing this uh, research, uh, sometimes I wonder uh, whether I should have... Uh, <laughs> 
become a lawyer and 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 and, and work on constitutional law. But anyway, it's too late for that. It's it's it's, <laughs> it's a fun job. I I suggest it. But you already got your PhD and everything. Let's talk about consequences though, and, and just how this is perceived. We we talked a lot about whether it was necessary, raising the price of gold, all these things, and and Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz had had sort of said in their history that it, quote, discouraged business investment, that this was a, a bad policy for FDR to do. We talked about some of the weirdness of it, setting the price of gold from your bed. Uh, what can we say? I mean, it's hard to do the counterfactual, but what we can what can we say about, you know, how this was done, whether it should have been done, or and whether there was some other way of doing it that would have been better? Let me take that from the following perspective. One of the things that we teach our students uh, when we teach economics at uh, any level, grad level or undergrad level, is that uh, if a country uh, repudiates its sovereign debt or restructures it in a unilateral fashion, imposing great uh, costs uh, to creditors, uh, that th the market will punish that country and it will have no access to capital markets for some time. Um, and when it does, it will have to pay a very high premium, uh, risk premium, because of uh, the precedent that um, its reputation uh, has created. Uh, we don't see any of this in uh, this case in the US. Uh, the US had no problem, uh, the government falling its debt. Uh, it didn't have to pay a higher price or, or, or higher yield. Um, uh, it was not punished uh, by the markets in spite of what Milton and Anna say. Uh, by the way, they only have a very short uh, paragraph on the gold clause, which was surprising to me. And uh, likewise, Alan Meltzer uh, also uh, devotes very little uh, space to it in uh, his magnificent history of the Federal Reserve. I talked to both Milton and and Alan uh, extensively about about the issue. So, I was fortunate to be a colleague of Milton Friedman um, in uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger's um, Council of Economic Advisors here in California. And during coffee breaks, um, I would ask Milton about the the episode, and and uh, so we, we 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 talked quite a bit about it. But the surprising thing is, as I said, the U.S. was not punished uh, by the market. Um, and then we have to uh, sort of speculate why was that? I mean, you can see Argentina, Greece, uh, all of these countries uh, severely punished uh, the Dominican Republic. I mean, you go through the list, all of them are punished by, by the market in, in, in more modern uh, debt restructure. And the point that I make in the, in, in the book is that this was seen by the market as an excusable uh, default. Um, uh, and, and in part because of what you said earlier, which is that uh, if you get out of the gold standard, that's a big if, uh, we, we can get to that, uh, then you have to get rid of the gold clauses. And it was done by following due process. An independent judiciary uh, looked at the case. Um, uh, uh, claimants had uh, all the time in the world and all the resources to present their case. Uh, the Supreme Court deliberated uh, very long and 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 and, and, and seriously about it, um, and and um, and at the end, I think that 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 the market understood that uh, there was necessity, there was a need to do this in order to get out of the Great uh, Depression. The fact that let me let me just say one more thing: the fact that a year had gone by, 1934, the whole of 1934 had gone by between. The raising the price of gold by 69% and the cases, and that that year was a year of great economic recovery, I think also played a very important role. Because the market said, well, it was needed, and the way things are working shows that it was a good thing to do. We are recovering. The U.S. is improving. Well, it was moving up from a very low point, and, and of course, it 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 would crash again in 1937 and, right. and, and never he, really. That, that is true, yeah. <laughs> so that could have been, I mean, it's hard to do the counterfactual. I, I, I've, I, as a lawyer, the, the reasoning in the gold clause cases is, is quite suspect and um, using this necessity, but but I, but I as you, as an economist, it's an interesting that, as you said, this that we didn't see this uh, this consequence of, of public 
debt being difficult to market, punishing the repudiation of the debt. Um, but in that sense, we, so since we've seen so many South American countries and, and Euro crisis countries do a similar thing, um, this, would, this shouldn't be something that we would advise anyone to do now. But, but I want to ask you the question that you asked at the end of your book, which is, could this happen again? Uh, yes. Um, so we would not uh, advise countries to do this. Now, um, what we have now is a situation where the government used um, uh, the necessity uh, argument and the Supreme Court uh, agreed with the government. Um, could that happen again? Um, it, it happens every day, right? Argentina used that argument, except that the tribunals did not side with Argentina, that the Argentina lawyers uh, know their constitutional law, know their president, and they use the case, uh, the, 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 the same argument. Uh, now, why the tribunals did not side with them, that's a different story. But, uh, I mean, look at Italy now. So uh, it has a new government, a very nationalistic, a Eurosceptic government, and they may decide that uh, in order to solve the Italian problems, there is the necessity for Italy to get out of the euro and uh, reissue the lira, at which point uh, the whole question of contracts will come up because every contract in Italy now is in euros. <laughs> and what if, 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 if they were to reintroduce the lira as the Greek seriously considered it reintroducing the drachma a few years back then, what do you do with the contracts? Uh, and, and, and then the necessity argument in this case would be invoked. So internationally, it could happen. It does happen. Could it happen in the U.S.? That's a more difficult, a more interesting question. And the point here is that uh, we have a huge uh, contingent uh, liabilities uh, debt, uh, contingent debt and, uh, or uh, undocumented debt that stems from Social Security um, and uh, from uh, uh, Medicare and Medicaid. And uh, people, including people at Cato, uh, who have uh, calculated the present value of the unfunded liabilities, think that uh, they are 400% uh, of GDP, 500% of GDP, they are all sorts of numbers. And at some point, uh, we could have the government say, well, we are going to change these contracts uh, or implicit contracts. And we are not going to pay according to promise, uh, and they, it will go to court. Um, uh, and people that think that there is a social security uh, crisis looming, uh, and I know that at Cato you have a very vibrant group uh, dealing with this issue, um, uh, think that, uh, that 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 could happen, and then the court could say, or, or the lawyers will say, well, look, this precedent in 35. Um, and uh, you guys once uh, uh, accepted the necessity argument, you should do it again. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please rate and review us on iTunes. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.